You're listening to the Telegraph Cycling Podcast, presented by Trainer Road, cycling's most effective training tool. I want to be the title sponsor. What's it going to cost? I'll take around ten million. Yeah, I, I, that's a bit out of my budget. I have the impression that we are in the place where we have to be now. Greg had a really bad back all last week, so we caught up on your podcast with really? me giving him a back massage and him listening to you guys. Oh, that's, that's a wonderful image. <laughs> with exclusive interviews and the best analysis on two wheels, this is the Telegraph Cycling Podcast. Where are we, Lionel? Uh, we're at Lords, the home of cricket. Fantastic stadium. Not the cricket season, is it? It's uh, the, the start of winter. Pitch is looking very green at the moment. Um, and we are here for the London Sports Writing Festival, the third year of this event. Uh, I think we've been involved one way or another in all three, haven't we? Uh, I think so. That, yeah, that is Lionel Burney. I'm Richard Moore. And we're also joined, rejoined by our old amigo, yeah. <laughs> Daniel Freib. Hello. How's it going? Daniel, you're back from Berlin. How's it going? It's all right. It's all right. Yeah, fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been, at, you've been much missed by the podcast. The listeners has been a, a clamor for your return. You're finally back. You're back back for good? No, I wouldn't say that. Um, in the famous words of Take That, no, I wouldn't say that I'm back for good. But you want me back. You want me back for good. We, we do want you back for good. Um, Try to remember the other is, lyric. Is my lipstick mark still on the coffee cup? Well, I have to ask Rob Hatch about that. I don't know, the home of cycling. Um, but Daniel, you've been in uh, Berlin. It's kind yes. of appropriate because you've been working on a on a book. Yes. We'll not say too much more about yes. that, but you've been deep in the bowels of various places and yeah, uh, meeting. The fangs of a project. Dangling on a tooth. Yeah. Going well? I wouldn't say that. <laughs> have you been following cycling while you've been away? wouldn't say that either. But yeah, a little bit, a little bit. Always, always. So we're here today, we're doing a cycling podcast live event at Lords, part of the London Sports Writing Festival, as Lionel said. Uh, that will be uh, released as a Friends of the Podcast special, number 10, I think. We've got two coming up. That'll be number 11. Number 10 is coming imminently, well, in a, in a week or so. And Which then, is, can we say what that is? Oh, I suppose we can do, yeah. I went to see Adam and Simon Yates, um, and we have an extended interview with the Yates brothers, Orica Green Edge Riders just come to the end of their second year as professionals and I went to see them in Lancashire where where they lived during the off-season. You had a puncture on route, didn't you, Lionel? But you still made it. I did, yeah. Um, Heroically. Heroic, yeah. Puncture on the M62. Had to had to call for support. I just stood in the, in the inside Neutral lane with my arm in the air. Neutral waiting, service. Waiting for the Mavic team car to come and... Uh, well, it was a yellow. It was an AA van. They're yellow, aren't they? You didn't borrow the vehicle of a rival team member, did you? And <laughs> rival get podcast. 20, and get a 20-second... Was it a 20 second penalty? Two, two minutes. Or was it? Yeah. No, I left in plenty of time, so I actually wasn't late despite the hour delay getting a, a, a spare wheel put on. So, yeah, that was a fairly eventful. Um, but they were in good form, and uh, people who have signed up to the Friend of the Podcast scheme will be able to listen to that around about the end of November, I think we're putting that out. So, you can still become a friend of the podcast for 2015 at the cyclingpodcast.com. That will give you access to 11 special podcasts. Mobile access coming very, very soon. That is being worked on, and it will be obviously fully up and running for 2016. Details of our 2016 Friends scheme will also be announced very soon. But c- continuing a bit of a theme this off season, this is a bit of a different podcast. We had Sean Kelly last week, Geraint Thomas the previous week. Next week, a special report from the Basque Country from me. I've just come back from San Sebastian. But this week we're doing a cycling literature special, um, which is appropriate given that we're here at the Sports Writing Festival. Uh, So we're going to look at a few uh, cycling books. Um, We've got Ed Pickering talking about his book published this year, The Yellow Jersey Club, which is a book about the the winners of the, the Tour de France, the members of that Yellow Jersey Club. And we've got Brendan Gallagher as well, who's written a chapter for the new cycling anthology on Hemingway and cycling. So we've got him talking about Hemingway. Really interesting. He did a lot of research for that. And also speaking more generally about cycling books. And the three of us will come back at the end. So let's hear first from Brendan, then from Ed, and then again from Brendan. Brendan Gallagher. Um, We're going to talk literature and cycling, cycling literature. Your chapter in the Cycling Anthology is all about Ernest Hemingway and his relationship with cycling. A deeper relationship than is reflected in in his written work, sadly. 
tell us a little bit about the chapter and where the idea came from. Well, the idea, essentially, I'm a Hemingway fan. Um, I've always enjoyed his writing, studied him at uh, university along with um, Orwell and other people like that. I was always aware of this link with cycling. There's always been a, there's been one or two tantalising passages in his actual published works. He was clearly a cycling fan for three or four years in his Paris years. Uh, that comes out in correspondence um, all over the place. And I just wanted to see, you know, how he approached it, what he made of it, and and possibly, you know, that that tantalising question: why he didn't write a, a definitive piece on cycling, or at least he doesn't appear to have done. But of course, you know, he left manuscripts all over Europe during his rather chaotic life. So you think there might be a hidden manuscript somewhere? Well, there, there's always that, that, that slight hope. I mean, he definitely, uh, or his wife, his first wife, Hadley, um, lost his entire work bar two pieces in the first three years of his, his time in Paris. And that, you know, as us as writers can relate to that, that must have been absolutely traumatic. Um, and that was right in the middle of his... Did he not back up? Did he not have it on the hard drive? <laughs> I don't know how these guys managed it in those years. I mean, everything, I mean, he hand wrote at that stage. Yeah. Everything was handwritten. Um, but yes, uh, his, his wife managed to lose everything. Uh, and who knows, somewhere in that bag, in a, in a, in a carriage in Gare de Leon, might have been a, a really big piece on cycling. Um, and of course, he, he wrote notes as, as, he, as he moved around the world. Uh, and again, 20 years later, he found, a, or the Ritz Hotel in Paris phoned him up and said, look, we've got a, a trunk here full of your stuff. You left it here in the 1930s. And in that was definitely one of the passages that he, he did write about on cycling, which appeared in A Movable Feast, which is possibly, arguably, his, his best book, certainly his best later book. Mm. Yeah, A Movable Feast is his memoir of his time in Paris, and it is fantastic. And there is that passage in there about cycling. You know, he, he went to the, the track in Paris, but he was also, it seemed, fascinated by roads, the road cycling. And he, he talked about intending one day to turn his hand to to writing about cycling but he feared that in English it wouldn't be the same that it almost the sport belonged to the French and the French language do you think that was the obstacle I think it probably was I, I mean he, he's an you know, extraordinary writer and a very very clever guy certainly on, on literary subjects and I think he realized that he had limitations here you know he loved the sport he loved the the scene the milieu but his French wasn't great his Spanish was much better than his French um, and you know, cycling is a complicated sport, as we know. And he was struggling to uh, understand all the nuances, and, and he feared that some of the French writers, the Spanish writers, you know, had the up on him here, and that they knew the sport better than he did, and that that wouldn't really be acceptable in, in his mind. But you could see you can see him straining at least wanting to do a big cycling book, and he and he warned his his big friend John dos Passos off. You know, uh, they were talking about cycling. It was quite clear. Hemingway made him uh, quite clear that this is my domain, you know, I'm going to be writing the stuff on cycling, you, you steer clear of this. Uh, but alas, he never really did do the big treatment. Famously, Hemingway was drawn to sports, bullfighting, hunting, fishing, um, and, and war, not, not, not so much a sport, but these pursuits that were expressions of, of manliness, manhood. Um, what do you think appealed to him about cycling? What Was it that, that same... Thing of it being a, such a tough, brutal sport and a, almost a test of manliness, if you like. Yeah, I think I think it's all of that. Um, you know, he, he was a man of extremes. He, you know, he liked uh, man in extremis uh, at his physical limit, at his mental limit. Uh, he liked geography, topography, mountainsides, deserts, heat, cold. He loved all that. So there's an instant appeal there. The other thing what he absolutely loved was the inside track and the feeling of a, a little closed society. Um, and his other lengthy passage that he did actually write about cycling was um, in A Farewell to Arms, where he stumbles upon um, the penultimate day of the Pays de Basque, the Tour de Pays de Basque. And he writes quite a lengthy passage here on what he sees and what he observes. And what he sees and observes, to me, is almost like a scene from... Um, the mess of a, of a company at war. You know, it, it's a band of men. Uh, perhaps they've come back from the, from the front, you know, 10 miles back the front. There's, there's an evening of wine, women and song. There's a couple of sort of women with them, but it's not quite... I think he says he wasn't sure who they were with, who they belonged to, actually, was the expression he used. There's a lot of jargon, slang, inside chat, knowing winks, um, bawdy humour. Um, and there was also that element about the race wasn't exactly fixed, but they were all in this together. This was a show. This was an entertainment. They would all profit from it. They would all get some money at the end of it. 
um, and everybody knew that and everybody knew how it worked and uh, I mean that is, his, that is his, definitely his one polished piece on writing uh, the other piece was his sort of notes on a night at the track circuit this was his sort of polished take on road racing I think it's very informative how he talks about it this, this is the scene that he absolutely loves this inside track We're going to talk about Edward Pickering's new book, latest book, The Yellow Jersey Club. Hello, Edward. Hi, Lionel. Well, first of all, could you just talk me through how the idea came up? Obviously, the Tour de France is the biggest bike race in the world. It's not a huge stretch of the imagination to write a book about the Tour, but to focus on the individual winners. You know, where did that idea and the inspiration for that come from? I've wanted to write the book for quite a few years. The, um, the idea of looking at the Tour de France through the winners seemed quite an interesting one. It's it after I watched the presentation of the Green Blazer to the... Is that the right word, the Green Blazer, to the winner of the US Masters Golf Championship? It kind of very... It happens in a... The presentation for the US Masters um, golf tournament happens in a kind of wooden lined room and it's a log cabin isn't it it could be a log cabin yeah. Yeah. A, a wooden lined room as we, we, we know it in, in the UK and it kind of made me think that the winners of that competition belong to a very exclusive club and I, I easily transpose that to the winners of the Tour de France and I had a, a little practice run on this on this book for your cycling anthology um, when I wrote the, a, a, a chapter called the, the Tour Winners Club, when I wrote about Bernard Thévenet and Jan Janssen, who are two winners I'd been quite heavily identified with and enjoyed. And I kind of had a little practice run at why it was important um, to write about the Tour Winners then. Um, and then, then decided that it would make a good book. A, chap, a chapter per winner on the, on the last 20 or so winners. And, um, but not centred on so much on what happened when they won the race, like in terms of the race unfolding, more from the personalities and the, you know, the having a personality-led account of the tour winners seemed to be quite interesting. What struck me was that it starts after Eddie Merckx's retirement. If you like, Eddie Merckx still retains this mystique as the greatest ever, and yet the book picks up the Tour de France's illustrious history at the point that he is no mo- no longer a, a, a current figure and we kick off with Bernard Thévenet who won the 1975 tour um, was that a conscious decision what did you why why pick a particular time frame or did you pick a particular time frame or am I just reading too much into it there and thinking that because it's 2015 now we've gone back to 1975 and it just sort of neatly wraps up as 40 years yeah, it's more of a happy accident, really. Although now, now that that accident happened, I have rationalised it and made it made it look deliberate. Um, I didn't really want to write about Merckx because he seems to me to be from another from another era. I wanted to have the book in the in the modern era. Ori- or, you know, I'll admit, originally I wanted to find all the living winners, um, but as soon as I I tried to get an interview with Ferdinand Kubler, who won the tour in the in 1950, I think in the early, in early 50s, who's still alive. He's very frail, very ill, and I had a few conversations with his wife, and she made it clear that I wasn't going to get an interview. So, so I couldn't just do the the living winners of the tour. So I, I thought the best thing to do is do it chronologically. Um, the Merckx era, ending in 1975, kind of fits in with two things. First of all, uh, my life as a cycling fan. I started watching the tour in the mid 80s. I was born in 1973, so it seemed quite symmetrical. On, on, on that front and also when I counted them up there were 21 winners which is the same number of stages in the Tour de France and I thought well that's, that seems a good number to go for, go for. and the third reason which is you know, less, less important because I think there, there are two very good books on Eddie Merckx recently written by Daniel Freeb and um, William Fotheringham and I felt that they'd done the subject justice it would be good to start with Bernard Thévenet who people know a little bit less one of the chapters that I was most familiar with and enjoyed the most was the Laurent Fignon one. Not just because we both played golf with him once, and you do mention that um, in, in the chapter, but because you managed to kind of peel away at the, the, sort of the layers of, of a, a, a man who struck me always as being singularly unsuited for a sport as kind of tough and you know examinatory as cycling is. He... You know, he 
makes a point in his own book that he wasn't just the man who lost the 1989 tour, but he won it twice. But that just gets swept away. And it, your last line, I think, mentions that, you know, it just sort of echoes back to that point that he wasn't just the man who lost the most famous tour of all time or certainly the, well, the closest tour of all time, but th- that he won it twice. Um, the fact that he sort of passed away did that give there's a slightly melancholic sort of edge to that chapter I don't know whether that's just because of the way I was reading it or whether that was intentional or you know what you felt but there was just something about the fact that that Finion had almost this sort of tragic relationship with the tour and and died very young um, of, of all of the people I think other than Marco Pantani uh, yeah, Marco Pantani is the only other person on your list who's no longer with us. That seems to add something to it for me. Yeah, I was melancholic when I wrote Fignon, and I I am melancholic when I when I when I think about him for for quite a few reasons. First, I I I, I knew him a bit better because when he when he came over to London, we spent we spent a bit of time together. I I, I had a nice interview with him, and he you know you'll 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 back me up on this. He was he was he was great company. On the on on when we when we took him for a round of golf and he was he was great company but he was also very ordinary company. He was actually quite a he was he was a nice man um, and I, I I've you know it's it's a shame that he you know he he died tragically young really I think he was fifty when he died and that that's that's too young and I did get the impression that in the course of his life he did have a lot of kind of joie de vivre and he kind of em- embraced life not just in terms of his cycling but when when we, we we took him for a meal in london and he you know talked to me and phil o'connor the photographer who, who came with us to, about how much he loved food and loved entertaining with his friends and he, he did say that he liked getting large groups of friends together um to to cook for them and for all, just just to be together to, you know with the, the food was a conduit for the, the conversation and I, I asked him whether he was kind of the life and soul of the party, or whether it was a talker or a listener in these situations, he said, "You know, he preferred to sit back and listen." And again, like like with all these people, we get presented with a quite simple description of the man. You know, Fignon, he's he's the kind of grumpy, bad-tempered guy who lost the 1989 Tour de France, but he's not. He is that, but he's also the entertainer who likes spending time with friends. He's the man who won two Tours de France, who won. Um, a Giro d'Italia as well and he's got more layers to him than than people give him credit for and I think having spent time with him I, I, I liked him a lot on a personal level and that's why I think you know I, I was quite sad about about writing about him because you know he I, I liked him a lot and it's a shame that he, he passed away. You said earlier on that you were itching to write some chapters and you, you got on with those first I mean in terms of working on the book your cast list is set for you you didn't have any decisions to make there other than perhaps the conundrum over Lance Armstrong and certain other years how did you actually go about it I mean what struck me was the depth of research and other reading that you've done to give yourself that kind of if 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 we were to talk about this as a sort of a, a, a a stew you you made a very rich stock by uh, by by reading a, a heck of a lot of material i mean was that an enjoyable process was that what you did first i mean how did you kind of go about putting these 21 chapters together yeah it's a, in, enjoyable no because it, it's it's a big job and i want to do it justice so it it wasn't enjoyable because there was a huge huge amount of work to do and i put myself under a lot of pressure to to you know make sure that in each chapter there was something new fresh original and that each chapter would stand on its own as a as a piece of work so in terms of the research um i've been watching cycling since the mid 80s and i i've i've read a lot about it and i've got i counted my cycling book trees and i've got over 200 cycling books and numerous cycling magazines and i, I went through everyone with a fine tooth comb so i spent quite a lot of time holed up in in my study at home reading through all the material I could find on, on each of these 21 individuals. And I, I, I opened, I made 21 Word documents and made, made notes on each one. Um, once, once I'd finished with the, the kind of secondary sources, the, the books and the magazines, I started speaking to people and speaking to the actual tour winners themselves. I got interviews with some and not, not others. Started speaking to them, started speaking, and this is just as important, speaking to people who knew them teammates rivals friends other other riders 
um, and started building up a picture. And as, as the picture of each rider started emerging, I started working out what the structure of each chapter would be and what, what was important. And this wasn't all happening 21 chapters at a time or doing it in order. You know, I didn't really start on some chapters till after I'd finished others, but that's, that's the base kind of structure of my research. Once I'd done the interviews and transcribed them and, and thought about it a bit more, I, I started writing. And then I, I, I wrote the, the, the Bradley Wiggins chapter first. Um, it, it seemed to me a good, good place to start because I think Wiggins bring There's something about Wiggins and, funnily enough, Lance Armstrong as well, um, that I, I think that they've brought out the best in a lot of cycling writers. I think that some of the writing about Lance Armstrong and Wiggins has been irrespective of what you think about the riders themselves or irrespective of what you th- whether you agree with the writer or not, the writing about those two writers has been, riders has been really, really strong. Um, so I thought, I'll start with Wiggins, and I had, I had the research done, and I, I knew what I wanted to say, and also... I've watched Wiggins a lot since the first time I met him for the first time in 2005 or 2006. I think maybe even earlier than that, actually. Um, it seemed quite immediate to me, so I tried to get that into the chapter, and that's why I started his chapter with a kind of eyewitness account of me, the, the first time I really kind of understood what Bradley, what Bradley Wiggins, the cyclist, was about, which is about this kind of the absolutely metronomic, perfect beautiful form that he has on a bike Every, everything that Bradley Wiggins has achieved has been, uh, that's been the foundation of it all and that's, that's why I started my chapter so the main thing was I didn't want 21 identikit kind of profiles where you start when they're born and then they learn how to ride a bike and then all this stuff happens and then they win the Tour de France and isn't it marvellous it, it, I, I didn't want that, I wanted each chapter to stand, stand alone as a piece of work and also not to get repetitive it's you know it's very important you, you, you it wouldn't take long to get bored if if i told the same story 21 times just change the names um so with with Thevenet, who's chapter one what's what's important with burden and Thevenet is that he is he is he is a child of you know what's what's known as la france profonde which is kind of he's, he comes from a very kind of generic hamlet in deep in rural france right in the center of france and I actually know this area very well. I spent a, a year living in a town called Moulin, which is very close to where uh, Bernard Thévenet grew up. It's the next prefecture over. Um, so I know this, the, the landscape of his upbringing and the kind of rural milieu that he grew up in is part and parcel of who he is. And he's also very popular in France. For, you know, he was very popular when he was a rider for, for that. You know, the French have got the French are suckers for the kind of... Uh, you know, they, they, they preferred Raymond Poulidor to Jacques Anquetil in the 60s because Poulidor was the kind of uncomplicated child of rural France whereas Anquetil was seen as a city slicker and they, they came down on the side of Poulidor um, and so I char- started the Thévenet chapter with a description of Le Guidon which is where he's from because that's the root of everything with, with Thévenet um, with, the, with the other chapters and um, with Greg Le Monde I wanted to symbolise that he was a symbol of cycling modernizing itself he was the first to introduce um, bigger salaries um, to introduce techno- technological change uh, well, his career coincided with it and he embraced a lot of it and so I, c- I, I kind of compare that with the cultural changes that happened in the 1980s and to me that Le Monde is a, a kind of he symbolizes the 1980s for me because the 1980s were in cycling a period of great technological and cultural change so each chapter I've tried to make specific to the rider in question and not to just tell the same story that's already been told about each guy. And do you have a, a favourite of all the 21, one that you, in hindsight, think stands as the strongest or the best or, or just the one that you, you, you feel sort of proudest of? I don't know. I, I mean, I, I, I do have my favourite. I have favourites for different reasons. I've got, you know, the... the, the the winners I would most like to go for a beer with. I, I, I give them the, the kind of the beer test, like who would I like to go for a beer with? Um, those people aren't necessarily the most interesting or the best at cycling. And so it's it's hard to answer that because I, I also have personal prejudices, you know, from, from my own you know from my own life that you know I, I grew up watching cycling as a teenager in the 1980s. So I've got a, I've got a, a real soft spot for Eno Le Mans. Roach, Delgado, 
on the other hand, I found Delgado's touring was actually a, a real... It, it was a bit of a dud as far as Tour de France goes. It wasn't very interesting. It was, as you say, it's, it's probably the least interesting thing about his entire relationship with the Tour. Ex- ex- exactly, yeah. De- Delgado is actually a lot more interesting as a loser than he was as a winner. But yeah, that's that's mostly what I've written about because that's that's mm-hmm. Pedro Delgado. So in terms of a favourite, I, li- I like Greg LeMond a lot purely because he was he, he he was a childhood hero. I mean, he's not he's not my hero now, but he 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 was a hero when I was a child. That leaves an impression on you always. I think it always always will do. Um, plus, when I interviewed him, he he is absolute gold for a, a journalist because he's he's generous with his time and insight. Um, like I said in the in, in in the book, I I was interviewing him. One of his answers went on for 38 minutes, and that's Greg Lamont. It's not necessarily the answer that I was looking for or anything to do with the question I asked, but that's Lamont, and I, I like him a lot because he, he he is a great guy, and he also was badly treated by cycling, not by everybody, but by a lot of people in cycling for a long time. So I've got sympathy for him as well. Um, I like Bradley Wiggins as well, but I I find him interesting. I find him compelling. I think he bring he he's got a fascinating character, and he seems to have a relationship with the British, not just cycling public, with more so with the British sporting public and general public that no other cyclist has managed to replicate. Not even Mark Cavendish. Uh, and there's something about Wiggins' character which I find magnetic. I don't think we'd be best mates if he wasn't a great cyclist. I don't think I'd be best mates with him or anything. You're I, not best mates with I'm him, are you? Best, <laughs> I'm not best mates with Bradley Wiggins. I'd, I'd, I'd scarcely go so, far, go so far to say we're mates. <laughs> but I find him compelling, but that's not the same as liking him on a personal level. I mean, he, he's, he's got a magnetic personality which I can't resist, which I can't resist writing about and finding, finding interesting. Um, and I, I liked, you know, people like Lucien Van Imp and Bernard Thévenet, they're old enough not to have egos anymore and they're, they're great to talk to because there, there is a lack of ego there which you don't tend to find so much with the younger ones. Brendan Gallagher, you picked a, a list last year of, of 10 outstanding books in your view, but what, I mean, pick, pick a few and then ultimately pick your, what, what you think is the best one. Well, let me start backwards. The best book is always Jeffrey Nicholson's book, for my, in my opinion, The Great Bike Race. And on, and on so many levels, um, I mean, just uh, to be able to write like that, I'm so envious. Just a beautiful writer. And you can go back to the, that, that book every single time and find a little phrase or a little a nuance which you hadn't picked up before. It's absolutely gorgeously written. Um, so I absolutely love that book. I also love it, in it kind of in its innocence because... We know that the Tour de France is is got many facets, and, and lot, some of them, you know, don't bear close scrutiny. But it was written in the in the mid seventies. Um, doping wasn't considered quite so um, heinous. That, that the, you know, you'd get a ten minute fine, I think, and two hundred and fifty francs if you got caught. So he didn't dwell on it. He didn't ignore it, uh, unlike some people think he ignored it. But he didn't dwell on it, uh, and he he saw the race from the from the roadside almost. That's, that's the spectacle that everybody sees every day. The one million people on the road. You know, they might read about the doping at nine o'clock in Le Keep, but by 10.30, they're on the roadside. The kids are having a day off. They're having uh, lunch with the parents and the grandparents, all that stuff. And he never loses sight of that. And he never loses sight of the racing and the characters. Um, so it's like a sort of annual renewal to read that book. Just, to well, I, just I mean, you mentioned Sam Abd earlier, and Sam Abd has written a chapter about that book, um, Sam Abd covered that tour as well and, and knew Jeffrey Nicholson, but uh, Sam's written about it in the new cycling anthology, and that's volume six. And he, he does pick out a few lines, as you say, he does have a, a turn of phrase. Anybody who knows these writers will instantly um, recognise it. If Eddie Merck says, the Belgian grand seigneur of cycle racing, the most successful, most versatile, and richest cyclist of all times in strength of character, the noblest Roman of them all. He has high-cheeked, graven features of a totem pole, and they break into laughter just about as often. <laughs> this, I, I love this one, actually. Francesco Moser, a handsome downhill racer from the Dolomites who always carries with, with him, like a whiff of aftershave, a touch of the expensive glamour of winter sports. Absolutely. Fred, Freddie Martin is the fastest sprinter in road racing, climbs as though he were pushing a barrel ahead of him 
That's absolutely <laughs> spot on. <laughs> absolutely, and, and and he 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 sort of writes effortlessly. He, he he brings you into the trip. You know, you're on the road trip with him. You're sitting in the back of the old car. Phil Liggett's driving. Uh, David Sanders is probably you know um, navigating and and whatever. And and Jeff's in the back there and is uh, probably tucking into his baguette and just observing and, and watching. And uh, it's, it's a delightful book. And it's yes, it's not hardcore. It's not. You know, there are all sorts of cycling books, and they all have their qualities. You know, and you've got the the Mayor Coopers and the Exposés, and that, you know, they, these are terrific books, and they um, they they bring the truth to the reader. But you know, it's probably an exception, but not all of them are that brilliant books to read. You know, they're quite hard. They're, they're not particularly fluent and literary. And you and you read them, and you and you absorb it, and you put them on the shelf, and you probably go only go back to them when you need to check those facts. I mean. Um, I would say an exception, that would be Paul Kimmage's Rough Ride, which is not only a sort of really hard look at the sport as it was then, but also a beautifully written book. You know, again, great turns of phrase. Um, so you've got those sort of books. Um, you've got the really well-written biographies, or, or, or mainly biographies, actually. Autobiographies are quite difficult, I think. But the biographies, and, and you've got um, Will Fotheringham's Tom Simpson, uh, you've got your brilliant work on uh, Robert Miller, which, you know, again, it's something uh, you, you go back to because it, it's there's always there's a nuance there always. There's something which you hadn't really absorbed first time. I don't go back to it. <laughs> Are you like me that you, you find it impossible to read anything you've ever written? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, it's very difficult, isn't it? I think five years is normally the, the, mm. the, the distance you have to put between writing something and reading it. Mm. Um, so, that, so that's another and, and I think cycling is very well served with those sort of biographical type books I think you know there's some terrific stuff out there and then and then you've got the Woody Allen who's Sam Apt you know I mean I'm just such a a convert and a fan of his writing and it's um, he seems to he, his style is he, he, he deals mainly in the sort of 1500 word 2000 word short story mm. and uh, it, it's always not quite what you think it's going to be he starts off on the subject uh, he'll start serious and then go funny or he'll start funny and then go serious mm. and he, he dives into all sorts of subject matter I mean he had me crying once he, he, I, I can't remember exactly where I, which book it was in but he wrote a bit about you know the the departure of the circus and, and what it was it, uh, he, he was covering a race and about four or five days into the race he had to go he, he couldn't cover it anymore and he woke up one morning and the circus was leaving town and he was on his own having a coffee and that was it. He was on his own. And, and all his mates had gone, all the riders had gone, all the mechanics. And, and that, that in itself was quite poignant. But I happened to be reading it on a day I was covering the first women's tour. And I'd had almost exactly the same experience. I'd arrived at a hotel at 9.30 that night, beautiful May night. And the car park was absolutely buzzing. There was about nine, ten team cars, floodlights. Um, there was the, the power hoses, there was the mechanics, there was people ordering up food, it was, food was coming in, somebody had rigged up some sounds, you know, and I'd squeezed in and parked up. And then the next morning, I, I was bailing out for a day or two, and I made a, quite a late start by my standards, got up, leisurely breakfast, read the paper, about quarter to nine I went out, and my car was the only car in the car park. It was the only vehicle, and just ten hours earlier, that had been like a village, and it had gone, it was just... And the, and the transient feeling of that was extraordinary. And then to read Sam put that into words uh, around that time was, uh, yeah, I mean, it almost brings tears to your eyes. It's, uh, he's the master as well of the, the dry, uh, you know, dry humour. Uh, you mentioned the comparison with Woody Allen is very good. He's a similar um, you know, very deadpan delivery in, in person, but in, in print as well. Um, <laughs> I remember an introduction to a story he was writing about Axel Merckx on his retirement, um, saying, you know, Axel Merckx part of a famous cycling dynasty who between them have 526 <laughs> professional victories <laughs> and of course his father um, Eddie had 525 professional <laughs> victories well, well I shamelessly borrowed from that in one of the pieces I wrote because I, I once possibly the highlight of my journalistic career was spending the day with Peter O'Toole and um, uh, Richard Harris at a, at a rugby day and uh, I picked up Harris from the Savoy we were heading for Twickenham for a Munster match, and then we picked up O'Toole so, from a, a salubrious hotel in Richmond. So I had these two reprobates in the... In the well, when was this? This was 2000 yeah. uh, for the Heineken Cup finals. I had these two reprobates in the back of the car with me, 
And I looked around and I, I thought, I've got a little crack here, um, but I don't, I'm not sure if I should use this. I said, okay, I'll, I'll go for it. I said, uh, Richard and Peter, do you realise that between us we've got nine Oscar nominations in this car? <laughs> And luckily, they took it fairly well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back on to cycling. Well, you were, so the Great Bike Race is, is the best one, but a couple of others. And then this year, 2015, what? We're gonna, this podcast is going to go out before Christmas, so Christmas ideas for people. What books are the standouts this year? Um, I, I'm really, I've been pretty busy this year, so I'm just tucking into most of the, the cycling books now. I mean, uh, the latest David Miller book, I'm halfway through that. I really like that. that that's coming along beautifully it's a sort of it's a sort of year in the life of but with knobs and, and a sort of deluxe version so um i'm really enjoying that a lot what else have we had this year there's a, ve- a very good book women in cycling rather than uh women cycling uh and that i think is uh put together by festina girl uh, and that is really good i've just finished that one uh it's 30 essays on with about women in, in cycling um and there's some very strong issues on that, uh, so I really enjoyed that. And, I mean, looking back over the years, where, where do you start, you know? Uh, I'm just trying to think the, the books I... Well, I, I, I pull Rough Ride out quite a bit and have a read of that. You know, that, that's the sort of along with um, the great bike races, the one you sort of have to read every year. Um, the biographies, they're the ones I go back to. I, I just like to, you know, the... the, the the inside track of those uh, those riders, what they did, and then of course, as information comes out over the years, you look at it anew, don't you? Um, oh, what else is a? Uh, uh, I, I liked your. I, I love that approach that you did with Robert Miller about trying to track somebody down uh, who doesn't necessarily want to be written about or mm. s- seek the publicity, but at the same time has got a story to tell. And I think you started with a genre there and. I, I, you know, any book that sets out to do that, I, I, I like and enjoy. There's no original ideas, or are there? I, I kind of copied uh, Jonathan Coe, a great novelist who wrote a book, a biography of B.S. Johnson, the obscure writer who committed suicide in the 70s. And um, he wrote a book called Like a Fiery Elephant, which is basically in search of mm. B.S. Johnson. Obviously, he's dead, so it's a bit different, but. It's a similar sort of detective story, and yeah. the, the author is, is central to it. I wanted to write a biography of Robert Miller, but the problem I had was that I didn't think Robert Miller would cooperate, and it was a, a friend of mine who said, well, go in search of, and then you're writing about your search rather than you know, the sort of definitive biography, I suppose. So it gives you a, a new angle on it, which you're always going to be able to... You, you've always got a story there, even if you don't find your quarry in the end i think i think all biographies are detective stories yeah. in a funny sort of way mm-hmm. and it's just whether you choose to present them as a detective story which then becomes a story in itself or you you do all the research and you say <laughs> okay this is what i've got and now i'm going to write that so that's an interesting one and of course the, the other development in recent years is the sort of participatory book where you become the person writing you know you, you become the person reliving the the famous 1914 Giro or mm. your Tim Moore's book yeah I mean now that is an entirely uh, wonderful book very funny very amusing but um, and that works on quite a few levels that's a history but it's also a, a personal adventure Geronimo it's called Geronimo that was yeah no, it was a re- really enjoyed that and it and it's it's part of a, I think we're going to get more and more of those books uh, in fact I think that's Tim not gone off and done the old um, peace race routes and round it Eastern Europe and Lithuania and Estonia and Russia and all sorts. Yeah, so honourable mentions off for To Hell on a Bike, riding Pyro Bay by Ian McGregor. A yeah. similar book, it's a history yeah. of Pyro Bay, which came out this year, coupled with Ian's uh, attempts to ride the, the Sportif. It's a, it's a sort of new new type of book. Tim Moore sort of pioneered that, in a sense, with French Revolutions That's a few years world ago. World so he, he rode the, the route of the Tour de France. And he, uh, he's a very, very funny comic writer who's written a lot of travel books, but cycling, his cy- certainly French Revolution was very popular. And of course, I, I think we ought to doff our caps as well as someone like Herbie Sykes, who does that really sort of hardcore investigative piece um, recently about the East German regime, the peace race, and, and the, the rider who uh, managed to escape to the West. Now, you know, I, I sort of tipped the cap in a couple of ways there. I mean, not only was it a, 
a magnificent story, but the detective work that went on there to access the Stasi files, to, to, to talk to the, the people involved and to, to either be fluent in the language or find somebody who was fluent in the language to translate everything. I mean, a, a mighty piece of work. The Race Against the Stasi, that came out 2014, I think. Yeah, I mean, that was one of the best books of last year, wasn't it? I think it, it, it might have even won some sort of award for that. And, and, and rightly so, it was a beautifully put together piece of work. Nicole Cook's book, I think you were a little bit involved in that as well, were you? Well, yes, and only in that um, the, the manuscript came in way too... It was all Nicole's work, mm-hmm. and, and then I applaud her for that. It was fantastic, but it was too long. It was, it was 200,000 words, and it had to be subbed down to, you know, 115, 120, and, mm-hmm. and restructured a bit. But I, I would say that was a, a super sub job rather than a writing job. I mean, I, you know, I, I contributed nothing in terms of uh, content. I just reduced the content and tried to... Um, and I thought that was a, a very good book. Um, as, I re- as I read through it and, and sort of worked on it, there was s- some very strong passages. Uh, and some, uh, one of the particularly good aspects of that book was rarely have I understood tactics better than when Nicole was trying to explain them. I mean, she really brings you into a race in a way that I hadn't experienced before. You ghost wrote Bradley Wiggins' first autobiography. Um, how... Can you tell us a bit about how that process works? How collaborative is it? Uh, very collaborative, and, and ghosting is an absolute art, and, and I wouldn't claim to have mastered it in any way. I've also ghosted um, Brian O'Driscoll, and a, a, in fact, I ghosted a second Brad book, uh, and I've got another couple of ghosting books in, in the pipeline. It's uh, You've got to eat humble pie when you ghost. You're, you're, you're not the star. It has to be the voice of the subject matter, I mean, it really has to be the voice, language, and terminology. You can't be inputting your language and your terminology uh, and your thoughts. Um, so that, you have to sit back and, and um, almost go into neutral. You have to go into neutral, get everything down, write it as best you can in the voice of the subject, and then it goes back to the subject. He or she refines it, sends it back to you, you send it back. It's quite a long process, but it's well worth it yeah, if you can get it right and, and with Brad for example um, he's not a difficult voice to get I mean Brad is a huge character and but, but it is also important you get that voice because everybody knows what it's like yeah. if you, everybody will know if he said it or somebody else or if you're writing it mm. so you're under pressure there but he is a, a fairly easy voice to get um, so I I quite enjoy ghosting I mean it is unparalleled access to some of the greats uh, and that you know as a, as a journalist as a writer as a sports fan is um, you know wonderful you, you can't buy that but it's, it's quite a tough job and, and it's not easy always to get it right The Telegraph Cycling Podcast brought to you by Trainer Road cycling's most effective training tool pair your power meter with over 800 workouts and 80 training plans to make you a faster cyclist Visit trainerroad.com forward slash TCP to try Trainer Road risk free for 30 days. Okay, you heard there our extended Trainer Road jingle uh, after he, we heard from Brendan Gallagher, Ed Pickering. And um, Trainer Road, thank you very much to them for sponsoring us throughout the winter. Uh, very much appreciated helping to keep this weekly podcast free. Thank you. Uh, and we've been following our trainer road programs well I haven't I've had two weeks off I've been in San Sebastian and I did rent a bike out there uh, and I rode the bike quite a lot but I didn't follow the the trainer road programs because it was difficult out in the road but it was very hilly so I think I've come back in decent shape but Lionel you've been religiously following (laughs) the program when I say decent shape I mean it's it's all relative yeah yeah I've been following the program Um, as you know it's not really my bag anything any like any hard work really um not really hard physical work I'm just not made for it i'm just haven't got the willpower um and so i was really nervous about being able to stick to this program of three rides a week on the indoor trainer which i find miserable really i make no bones about it i'm this is not what i like doing at all with my time but eight nine sessions in um i'm i haven't missed a session yet i'm on top of it i feel like um starting to make small improvements i had 10 days of it i was quite enjoying it i, I quite enjoy the way the sessions are structured you don't get bored even things i was quite skeptical about like one-legged cycling mm. has been fascinating for me because i had a, a hip replacement a few years ago and i did a lot of rehab afterwards it was supposed to get my body rebalanced but what i learned from this is actually i've 
it it hasn't. My left leg is considerably stronger than my right leg where the the operation was. So it, it for me, it's been really interesting, and it shows me that I've got work to do. Daniel, I think you've been observing your housemate, Rob Hatch, who's been following the program as well. Yeah, I've seen him a couple of times. Uh, well, last week, so I've only been back a week, um, regularly returned to the home of cycling to find Hatch swimming in his own perspiration and growling... Um, growling encouragement at himself in the style. What was Rocky Balboa's old trainer? <laughs> sort of along those Alonso, lines. No, Apollo Reed. Was it? No, that, Apo- was his, that was his um, nemesis, wasn't it? I think. I'm not sure. And, and he's a very delicate flower. Generally, is Rob in all aspects of life? I would <laughs> venture to say. And um, he seems to have a lot of ailments, a lot of complaints. He's always he's worried about his form. He's worried about his rivals, his competitors. He's worried about his crooked pedaling style. Um, so it's an it's an emotional roller coaster. Even just observing him trying to complete this program and um, what it has been over the last few days well we've got a, a, a chat coming up this week Lionel with Chad Timmerman the coach at Trainer Road who's going to we're just going to get a bit of feedback from him and, and, and talk about what's coming up and we'll, we'll hear from him in a future podcast but thanks again to Trainer Road we also want to um, say a few more thank yous because this last week we were we won best podcast at the Cycling Media Awards which was very nice and you were there Lionel to accept the award on our behalf yeah I didn't mention either of you um, but I did did accept the award which uh, we're very pleased to have won where is it well Nigel Brown has it um, in his office shouldn't it be shared between us well I thought I'd give it to him because he's London based and then you two could go and have a look at the award and maybe he will let you sort of touch it and pick it up but perhaps we ought to have it on a rotation four months each yeah, pose for. I don't know if I trust it in the home of cycling. Thing, <laughs> things, things go, and things get lost in the home of cycling. I don't know. How's Marco Plantani? Um, he seems to have shrunk because Rob Hatch has installed in my bedroom a dehumidifier. Um, for some reason, he he seems to think this <laughs> very suspicious. <laughs> it's very you need to return home from Berlin to oh, find a dehumidifier. All sorts, of, all sorts of very suspicious things have gone on. There's a dehumidifier in my room. There's one. Cupboard in the kitchen is full of amino acids, absolutely full of various types doping, of amino, doping. <laughs> amino acids. Are, are you having to sort of skirt around the oxygen tent as well? <laughs> anyway, I'm not convinced that this dehumidifier is working, but... Um, not working on your hair, that's for sure. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, but Hatch dutifully um, appears in my bedroom um, <laughs> a couple of times a week to unload, to empty the dehumidifier of the water that's collected, and he pours it straight into Marco Plantani. This is what he's using to feed Marco Plantani, and I'm convinced that... That's very... That was quite admirable. I'm surprised he's not also collecting his own <laughs> sweat yeah. in order to... Offer oh, this would be this would be a wonderful... He set up the turbo trainer in your room while you've been away. <laughs> anyway, we thought winning this award um, gave us a perfect excuse to do something that we should have done probably a while ago and thank all the many people who have been of huge assistance to the cycling podcast i have to say most of these people uh, contacted us um to offer their help for free um they were listeners and um quite a few of them with expertise in different areas have just got in touch from radio producers to people um with mail shot skills marketing skills that kind of thing it's been really quite overwhelming since we started to receive all these offers of help. Um, first of all, we should thank the people who've sponsored us in 2015. Van Dessel Cycles uh, sponsored us back at the start of the year. British Eurosport uh, for most of the year. Jaguar, of course, for the Wiggins Our Record and the Tour de France. And Trainer Road, uh, who are seeing us through the winter. We also want to thank Jonathan Rowe, who's a producer and a really all-round uh, tech guru. He's behind a lot of the uh, the sort of tech support that we we try and offer um nigel brown of um dirt and glory paul scoynes john mooney alex Eddy, tom wally all our producers alice glossop french podcast lady how could i forget her paul shafto uh, also glass pear and 13 senses for the music that we use in our episodes thank you very much to them Jim Nicholson thank you to him and thank you to the Tour de France uh, Thomas Cariou and Christian Prudhomme in particular friend of the podcast Prudy Intelligent Mobile as well thank you to them for their tech help and the Telegraph who are our media partners thank you very much to the Telegraph anyone else can you think of Lionel? Just our listeners thank you very much to all the listeners particularly the ones who give us feedback good bad and indifferent via Facebook or Twitter or email um, always good to hear what the listeners are making of what we're doing Thank you very much. Uh, this has been an episode devoted to cycling literature. Any 
books that you're reading. We want to. We're going to actually offer a couple of prizes. But any uh, anything, any books that you're reading or, or want to tell us about, Lionel? Um, oh gosh. Well, uh, the most recent cycling book I read was William Fotheringham's uh, book about Bernard Eno, which I enjoyed uh, tremendously because um, there's a certain sort of mystique to Eno's character, isn't there? And he he just peeled away at some of that and, and a lot of the stories in there that I didn't know um, so I found that really worth reading. Daniel I, I imagine you've not been reading too many general cycling books and maybe some obscure ones I've been reading a lot of books in German unfortunately um, about East German doping mainly um, not to give too much away um, a book I always like to remind people of because I think it's one of the best cycling books ever written unfortunately not written by anyone in my present company although you two have also contributed a great deal to the cycling canon but a book that I always like to mention is um, The Land of Second Chances by Tim Lewis a book about the Rwandan cycling team cycling in Rwanda um, doesn't get mentioned enough and for my money one of the best books that's been written on cycling in the last Ten years or so. One of the best books, full stop. I yeah. think written on any on any sport on any subject. Actually, um, I was in the Basque Country last week with Enrico Garati, who runs a publisher in uh, Spain, and he is publishing that book in Spanish. Um, that's coming out very soon. That's the next book that will be published by him, and I was delighted to hear that because the more people that get to read that book, the better. I think it's a terrific book. Well, yeah. Just before we wrap up, need to remind people that uh, if they've signed up for either as a friend of the podcast or if they've signed up to receive the Cycling Podcast weekly email bulletin, which will keep you abreast of all Cycling Podcast-related news. If you've signed up to either of those things in this week's newsletter, which will already be out by the time you're listening to this, um, there's a link to buy a copy of Sean Kelly's autobiography, Hunger, in paperback for just £5, um, which is basically a 50% discount. That's our my gift to the Cycling Podcast listeners. Uh, another couple of gifts then. I'm going to offer a copy of my book, Etap, which was published last year, um, to anybody who signs up. Not anybody, not everybody, but some person, one person at random will be picked uh, who signs up to receive our mail shot, which you can do through our website. Um, so anybody who signs up to that will be picked at random in the next week. Uh, so somebody who signs up in the next week um, will win that book. Also, Ed Pickering's book the yellow jersey club we're going to offer that as a prize these will both be signed i should say um we'll pick somebody who's already signed up as a friend of the or not a friend but on the mailing list if you know what i mean you don't have to be a friend of the podcast to join the mailing list so um join up and stand a chance to win my book a tap someone will be picked at random to win ed's book the yellow jersey club we should explain how people sign up go to thecyclingpodcast.com and a little window will appear uh, enter your email address and name and it's as simple as that and you'll get a weekly newsletter with an update and what's going on etc so we should wrap up we're going to get back into the normal swing of podcasting pretty soon obviously delighted that daniel's back um and you'll be joining us throughout the winter daniel you're not you're not disappearing yeah. off anywhere again are you um no plans at the moment but i'm unpredictable open to offers yes de- definitely <laughs> <laughs> right well listen we better we better we're going to go and do our event in a moment i think we've got some last minute preparations to do uh, so we'll go and do that you can hear this event as our friends of the podcast special in the next few weeks but for the moment thank you very much lionel thank you richard thank you daniel thank you you've been listening to the telegraph cycling podcast Thank you to Glass Pear for the music in this episode. For more information and to download more editions of the show, visit thecyclingpodcast.com.